Okay, the game starts out very classically. White chooses the romantic Italian bishop with bishop c4 instead of the more substantial Spanish bishop b5 in order to introduce immediate tactical possibilities against black's weak f7 square. Now, when black plays bishop c5 here, we have a gioco piano, which translates to the quiet game, but typically uh, it's anything but quiet. White plays the classical c3, preparing the d4 break. Black responds naturally with development and attacking the e4 pawn. d4 takes, takes, check, knight c3. Now white will lose this pawn temporarily, but his development easily compensates. Bishop takes. Now instead of playing mechanically, white plays d5. A very vigorous move. Black castles. Now this was the first move by black I thought was bad. It gives white too much latitude. This is an important psychological point, so much so that I'm going to say this twice. White now has a choice, completely absent of stress, on how to proceed with his initiative. White now has a choice, completely absent of stress, on how to proceed with his initiative. So even if White doesn't find the best theoretical line here, he'll obviously embark on a line that he decides is the most comfortable, and to allow that is a bad thing, period. I'm a big believer in making my opponent's discomfort a very high priority, because it provides the most fertile soil for his errors and his exhaustion. And that's a real part of tournament chess. So anyway, here I decided I wanted this bishop. Now he plays knight a5, putting his knight on the edge of the board, obviously a bad idea. But more seriously, it's unprotected. And it could easily become trapped here. I don't know what his best move was, maybe knight e7 or maybe knight d6 or something like that. But that's for him to figure out. I decided I wanted to keep my bishop, so I simply played bishop d3, putting pressure on the knight and also definitely with an eye on h7. He played f5. Immediately, without calculation, I did not like this for him. He's irreparably weakening his king without provocation. Weaknesses here that will not go away. But even more critically, his main problem is his development. Look at these pieces just buried back here. You can't play chess like this and expect to succeed. I'm such a believer in development and the initiative that when I see a lack of development like this, I smell blood. I feel compelled to launch a violent attack, as if otherwise I'd be strategically irresponsible. Anyway, he's in bad shape here. I reason that rook e1 in this position was in the category of obviously correct, putting the king's rook on its natural file and adding pressure to the black knight. And now he plays rook e8. Honestly, I was excited when he played this because I felt that he had no more room for mistakes with my lead in development. So this move must make my position winning. Most importantly, this rook e8 move does nothing to develop his minor pieces. It moves the already developed rook off the f file. So that doesn't really improve his position that much. And also simply, Rooks are just too heavy to be playing like this in the opening. They're five-point clumsy pieces. They're really endgame pieces. They're not meant to be protecting pawns and pieces in the opening against much more agile and expendable knights and bishops. So now I resolved the equilibrium was far too disturbed, and there must be some winning sequence right now. So I began calculations, and I finally come up with a very artful response. 
Rook takes e4. You know, my favorite player, the eighth world champion named Mikhail Tal, said, quote, chess, first of all, is art, end quote. And I believe that. Uh, chess is the most beautiful thing I know. And the ability to express myself with moves such as this is definitely why I play. So in this instance, I suppose I played passionately. That's uh, an accurate descriptor here. Okay, now look at this first idea in this line. I really love this. If he plays rook takes rook, I'm going to move my knight to g5. And now he won't have the best case scenario opportunity to liquidate his rook here with rook takes e1 check. He's going to need to put uh, the rook somewhere and lose a vital tempo that he surely doesn't have right now. I love that point. It's a subtle point. Now the knight is attacking the rook, f7 and h7. And the next move, the queen is coming to h5 with mating ideas. So he played pawn takes rook, as I had hoped, honestly, because this seemed to be the most elegant line. Look how beautifully white allows a fork one move after he's lost a rook. But now black's lack of harmony is exposed with bishop g5. His queen is trapped, so he's rather forced into playing rook e7. And now I play my favorite move of the game. Well, rook takes knight might be a... No, this definitely is my favorite, actually. Definitely. Now, in this position, what is Black's overriding problem? It's his painful lack of development. These pieces here are just doing nothing in a terrible time of need. And that's what's killing him right now, far more than my tactics. So instead of playing prosaically with Bishop takes Rook, I made my greatest effort to keep his main problem, his main problem, his undeveloped pieces. So I played a move characteristic of Morphe. I played pawn d6. This pawn sacrifice must be the winning move. He basically must take. And now his pieces are entombed forever. It's as if I've just won a bishop and rook instantly. These pieces can never have a future. And by the way, this move also weakens the a5, d8 diagonal, as can and does prove critical later on. This pawn d6 is a very instructive move. I knew later on I'd be very excited to show my students. So he takes. Now I play bishop takes pawn. He breaks the pin. I take. He takes. And now the remaining moves are divine reward for inspired play. Bang. Queen d5. Forking the king and unprotected knight. The king moves. And now the wayward knight is executed for its costly negligence. And now look how beautiful. The black queen desperately wants to take the bishop. But the weakened a5 d8 diagonal here has chained her to the d8 mating square. Notice how the black light squared bishop has actually become my ally, keeping the a8 rook from critical defensive duty, further illustrating the effect of 15 pawn d6. With little hope, black continued pawn b6, and now white's queen traverses the entire fifth rank to h5, threatening mate on h7. Black again would like to take the commanding e4 bishop here, but the obvious consequence of white's final piece activating to e1, pinning the queen to the e8 mating square, stifles such a hope. Black plays g6, and now, instead of the obvious bishop takes g6, white makes a better decision by continuing to allow the queen's passionate expression to d5 both centralizing and attacking the dormant rook. So the rook slides to b8, and now queen d4 forces the black queen to interpose at g7 because king g8 would lead to mate in two with bishop d5 and queen h8. 
So now white finally forces resignation with the sixth queen move in a row. Queen takes d6, winning the rook, while chaining the black queen to defense of checkmate at f8. And let us commend now the resolve of this lowly c3 pawn standing between the mighty black queen and checkmate at a1. Thank you for viewing, and let us remember, chess, first of all, is art.